Good evening and welcome to the City of Pasco Council meeting. The Council thanks you for being part of, the, part of the City Government. At meetings, the Council takes formal action on items, holds public hearings, and conducts other business of the City. Agenda packets are available on the City of Pasco's website at www.pasco-agenda.gov. agenda this meeting is also being televised live on PSC TV channel 191 on Spectrum Cable in Pasco and Richland and is streamed on the city of um, on the city's Facebook page, website, YouTube channel and go to webinar. This and previous council meeting video is available on the city's website. Lastly, the public may submit their comments and or questions by contacting the city manager, city clerk or by using the Ask Pasco app. And with that, can we get roll call please? Council members Brown? Present. Campos? Present. Milne? Present. Roach? Present. Serrano? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Maloney? Present. And Mayor Barajas? Present. And with that, would you please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to our uh, next item on the agenda, consent agenda. All items listed under the consent agenda are considered to be routine by the City Council and will be enacted by roll call vote as one motion in the form listed below. There is no separate discussion of these items. If further discussion is desired by council members or the public, the item may be removed from the consent agenda to the regular agenda and considered separately. Item A, approval of meeting minutes for January 3rd and 9th. Item B, bills and communications to approve claims in the total amount of $10,466,439.66. Resolution, item C, resolution number 4298, setting a public hearing date for Mendoza um, Row vacation, vacation 2022-007. Item D, resolution number 4299, setting a public hearing for Jubilee Foundation right-of-way vacation, vacation 2022-009. And with that, I will call on Council Member Campos if you can make a motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I would move to approve the consent agenda as read. There's a motion. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Seconded by Council Member Serrano. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 It's a roll call. Can I get a roll call vote, yes. please? Council Member Serrano? Yeah. Yes. Campos? Yes. Brown? Yes. Milne? Yes. Roach? Yes. Milney? Maloney, sorry. <laughs> yes. Pardon me. And Barajas? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we move on to item five, proclamations and acknowledgements. Not sure if Ben is in the room. Oh, I see you. Uh, so tonight we do have a proclamation. And Chief Gear, if you would like to make an introduction. Sure. Uh, I'm proud to introduce Ben Shear, our, our community risk reduction person that uh, has done a wonderful job over the last few years with really expanding that program and is actually pretty well known across the country for the work that he's done there. We get, get He gets invites quite frequently to, to speak about what we're doing with community risk reduction in the city of Pasco. So with that, Ben, I'll turn it over to you. Is there anything you'd like to say before the mayor reads your proclamation? Uh, no, we just appreciate the support of the city council and the city staff. Um, community risk reduction really is it's not just a new name, it's, it's not really a new product, it's a way of looking at things and really reducing the risk to our community, but if it's actually what it really comes down to is a more efficient way to make our community safe. So we appreciate the support of the City Council as we reach out. Thank you, and with that, I will read your proclamation. So Community Risk Reduction Week is January 16th through January 20, 2022, 23. Whereas Pasco Fire Department responded to 51 structure fires in 2022. 
and whereas the fire department restart, started responded to a growing number of medical calls for service surpassing 80% of total call volume and whereas community risk reduction is a data informed process to identify and prioritize local risks followed by integrated and strategic investment of resources to reduce their occurrence and impact and whereas the value of community support from local state and national partners to address community risk is recognized to meet the demands of the fire service and whereas the goal of community risk reduction is to reduce the occurrence and impact of emergency events for both community members and emergency responders through deliberate action in the areas of five E's of education, engineering, enforcement, emergency response, and economic incentive. And whereas most fire related and many medical calls for service are preventable with the five E's performed as part of an integrated community risk reduction program. And whereas Monday, January 16, 2022 is Martin Luther King Jr. Day and is nationally recognized as a national day of service and opportunity for communities to reduce the risk in their community through a series of educational and other programs. Now, therefore, I, Blanche Barajas, Mayor of the City of Pasco, Washington, on behalf of the entire city council do hereby proclaim January 16th to the 21st as Community Risk Reduction Week. It's long enough. <laughs> and with that, sir, I have a proclamation for you. I've known Ben for a few years, several years, um, and every time I see him out in the community, always doing something, whether it's changing um, the uh, carbon monoxide alarms, fire alarms, he's always doing some type of education. So your work is greatly appreciated. Thank you for everything that you do for the community. And with that, we will move on to our next item on the agenda, item number six. Visitors, other than agenda items, this item is provided to allow citizens the opportunity to bring items to the attention of the City Council or to express an opinion on an issue. Its purpose is not to provide a venue for debate or for the posing of questions with the expectation of an immediate response. Some questions require consideration by the Council over time and after a deliberative process with input from a number of different sources. Some questions are best directed to staff members who have access to specific information. Citizen comments will be normally be limited to three minutes each by the mayor. Those with lengthy messages are invited to summarize their comments and or submit written information for consideration by the council outside of formal meetings. With that, I would like to remind everyone that you do have three minutes and I don't want to stop anyone from speaking. We do have a timer. Um, please be considerate of your time allowed. Um, as you're coming close to your three minutes, please wrap up your comments. And again, thank you for being here and providing information. So with that, I'll invite um, anyone from the chambers for a comment. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. My name is Charles Grimm. Some of you I know, some of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet. I am a Pasco City resident. I have five children, ages 15 years to five months. I also own a business in West Pasco where I employ about 20 people. I know marijuana has been discussed ad nauseum over the last few months. Many of the arguments I've heard have either been either or, but I haven't seen much of a middle ground. I'm hoping to frame this conversation in a way to bring up a point or two that perhaps you haven't considered. If you've ever been to a casino on a Friday night, imagine a casino on a Friday night, everybody's dressed up, everybody looks good, they're out to have a good time. It's the type of atmosphere you'd see on a commercial of everybody having fun. But if you go back to that same casino on a Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., it's a completely different world. People are desperate. They're feeding an addiction. There's almost a look of pestilence on their face. 
In my mind, government has better things to do than to tell people if they can twist a joint in the comfort of their own living room or not. In fact, I actually voted for the legalization of marijuana for that reason, for the libertarian um, that's within me. Sure, there's health concerns, and it generally slows down people's ambition and motivation, but again, aren't there better things the government should be worried about? With that said, I'm also a chaplain down at the Union Gospel Mission where I volunteer with the homeless every week like I was there this morning. There's widespread addiction, mental health issues, and a homeless situation to consider. If you allow the sale of marijuana in your downtown core, do you think this will help or hinder the problem you already have down there? Another consideration is the DEA still classifies marijuana as a Schedule I narcotic, and by doing so, banks are not permitted to electronically wire funds to or from a marijuana shop. No debit or credit. It is a cash business. Okay? Everyone who walks in or out of the business will have cash or weed on them, not to mention the large amounts of cash on hand at the business. That's why armed robberies are so common in the Seattle area at these dispensaries. Do you really want to bring that to your downtown? Look, you have worked really hard to revitalize downtown. You have the overpass. You have Peanuts Park. I marvel why you would go so quick in this direction after all your hard work. So that's my challenge. Keep this out of C2. You have a resolution, a motion. I challenge you to go with B. Keep this in your industrial core. Keep it out at King City. See if the feds deregulate it so that large amounts of cash aren't going in and out of the business. Once you open up Pandora's box, there's no going back. And it's not going to be just one, but our downtown will be riddled with them. The 8 o'clock Friday night people that are making positive contributions to society will still get out to King City, and you'll get the revenue if that's what's driving your motivation. But I urge you and plead with you to consider the Tuesday at 10 a.m. person. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. You want to turn on your mic, please? You want to turn on your mic? There we go. Madam Mayor, Council Members, my name is John Rosen. I am a uh, citizen of Franklin County. I'm also an elected official of the county. I stood before uh, you back in October, <clears throat> and I had a, uh, a letter of petition signed by a dozen former police officers uh, opposed to legalizing a cannabis shop in the city of Pasco. Um, Former sheriff was one of them that had signed it. Captains that had served in this city. Sergeants that had served in this city. At least two of the individuals served outside of the city as police chiefs, but served as police officers in this city. All opposed to that going in there. And I said, it would be a shame for you to do it just to serve the almighty dollar. So I also have a letter <clears throat> signed by all three commissioners, and I hope the city council received copies of this, but I don't know that you did. It was mailed to you back in October. Um, all three county commissioners opposed it, and I might remind you that the constituents that elected them elected you as well. And other than Ms. Roach, none of you even came close to getting the number of elections or, or votes that they got from the citizens in your city. So I'd like to turn these back over to you to relook at and certainly reconsider approving anything that would legalize what's going to amount to increased crime. And I hate to say this, but I will. There will be injuries and even potential death if you take this action, and it will be directly as a result of that getting approved here. It may only be one. One's too many. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else wish to make a comment? Council, I actually have two comments. The one is I encourage you to look up the definition of an attractive nuisance and then place what uh, it appears that you all are poised to do, a marijuana shop in downtown Pasco, and see if the word and definition of attractive nuisance fits. I believe it does. A lot of kids floating around in this area. 
a lot of young families living in this area, and you're just putting a vice in the middle of those kids and their neighborhoods and where they grow to. The second thing I want to make a statement to you is the one-tenth of one percent mental health tax. That mental health tax this county has been uh, collecting now for two quarters, I believe, and that mental health tax was being collected with an agreement that we work in partnership with Benton County with that tax. Uh, from where I sit, that's not occurring. I'm encouraging all of you, before we write one check for that partnership and those agreements, to look at the usages of what that one-tenth of one percent can be used for, and that we use it rightly and correctly for the people of this community and Franklin County. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to make a statement? My name is uh, Eric Larson, and I'm with Evergreen State Investments. Um, I believe we've already gotten to the point where we've determined with evidence, not with conjecture or bias, that uh, cannabis, in a legal sense, is, it has its place in PASCO. Um, this is a chance for you guys as a council to prove that PASCO is business friendly and not a city that enacts de facto bans by heaping regulations and bureaucracy rather than uphold, upholding or, or turning down the ban. Conditional use permit doesn't serve any need except an additional bureaucratic process to create de facto roadblocks or bans. A vape shop looking to open up uh, to go through does not have to go through a conditional use process in Pasco to open up. A restaurant does not have to go through a process. But I'd argue that both of those have the ability to harm people if the, suits, if the food's not served correctly, uh, if a particular vape gets in the hands of a kid and the kid gets addicted, if they use a, a, a vape off the streets. This is a way to kind of get rid of the black market and open up a legal regulated market, okay? Um, I'll add, not one person has ever overdosed on pure cannabis product to the point of death in the United States, not one ever. Um, however, uh, they do perish with laced cannabis with fentanyl on the streets purchased illegally, which would not be a problem for a legal market because we would be uh, regulating all the ingredients in the cannabis would be right on the label, okay? Um, kids under 21 are not allowed in the store, um, yet the idea of applying conditional use permits is being discussed here, even though you have already legal stores that have some of the same dangers and they're, they're not sub subjected to conditional use permit. Um, all the council members I have listened to uh, do not necessarily have strong feelings one way or the other. The evidence is clear. The community came and spoke and at the listening sessions, um, there was a large percentage of people both on the QR code and speaking in person that supported cannabis. It was less that didn't. And most of the people, there was ones that didn't, but they just didn't want it downtown. They, they weren't, hadn't, didn't have a problem with cannabis in general, but they had a problem with it being in downtown. To me, that's support. Maybe you have to regulate it in, in, in one way or another in that sense, but um, the existing buffer is already in the existing zoning um, would satisfy the concern of not in my backyard. We're highly regulated stores. Um, in my opinion, Motion A is the best, most business-friendly option to meet both needs. The needs of the public to protect from any perceived or actual harm from these stores, while also protecting business owners' rights to, to do business with a legal business in the state of Washington. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Mayor and staff, I'm Rocky Mullen, Franklin County Commissioner, District 2, which encompasses most of East Pasco, the city of Connell, Mesa, Colotus. And I'm here to say that as an elected official, I've not been contacted by one person to tell me that this is a good idea. I've had numerous people call me and say what a bad idea this is. So as a representative of one third of the county in Franklin County, I'm here to say that the constituents that are calling me are asking for it to be declined. So in all fairness, as a representative of District 2, I'm, I'm here to say that everything that's come in my way has been in disagreement with it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else? <clears throat> Madam Mayor and Council, appreciate this time. Um, I'm on. I'm here on behalf of the, um, District Three. Uh, I live at 3902 Charleston Lane. Um, I just don't think it's a good idea to put in a downtown. Uh, but I'm also on the fence about even lifting the moratorium in general. Um, just by a lot of the stuff I see online, um, just like Commissioner Mullen said, you know, a lot of people contact him. It's it's not positive. Um, I, I know we always hear this mantra of one Pasco. I think a decision like this is going to divide Pasco. Um, I, I think it, it'd be prudent to have a vote, but I know the council doesn't want to wait on that. I think that's probably the best way to go, but um, I think we really just have to think long term the effects uh, that this is going to have on the city. As you can see in Spokane County, there's not a lot of money that comes from this, and they have tons of stores. So I think we got to think about the kids. You know, I think I think differently now that I've had kids than I did when I was 22 and didn't have any. <laughs> Um, I think about them and, and the things, I mean, I hear commercials all the time. Keep marijuana from, away from your kids, either on, uh, on the radio or on TV. And so, and again, I, and, and I, I don't even drink. So if people want to say, hey, we should get rid of alcohol, okay, hey, I'm not going to fight you on that. I, I don't care about those vices. So I think we just really need to think about the ramifications. But I did send um, City Clerk uh, Barnum uh, a list of about 60 to 70 business owners in downtown that are against this. Um, and there's a lot of people downtown that want it there too. But again, I think a lot of people are just, they don't want to come talk to you guys and you know, you would think they would want to, but a lot of people want to take it the, take, uh, a lot of people want to stay out of the political fray. So I understand that. But I think if I had to choose an option, it would be A or B, um, just stay out of C2 and I guess we'll see what happens. But I think we really need to think about, you guys really need to think about the decision you're making because we're not going to see the effects until a couple of years from now. So again, the city, I know the downtown area didn't want the um, Union Gospel Mission down there. And I know a lot of people have said, you know, a lot of people who supported it during that time wish they can go back and say, I shouldn't have supported that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I got to say something. So, something. <laughs> so Green to Go is the number can you, one. Can you please state your name? Yeah. Not just for the, record. the Green to Go is the number one profit producing retailer in the state of Washington. There's nowhere else to go for the Tri Cityans. They flock to that location. It's made Steve Lee a millionaire. So anything that you can do to open it up to them, I don't know. There's there's just more money to be made here. Okay? That's it. Thank you. And you had a comment? Yeah, Joe Cotta, Pasco resident. And I'm just, I'm, I'm disappointed in the consideration of marijuana being in Pasco in the sense that we're trying to do it. I'm just, I was just searching through the headlines and it's just kind of amazing. Marijuana use linked to higher risk of emergencies and hospitalizations. It's a CNN article. I'm a conservative guy, but that's, that's CNN. And they're saying it's a 25% higher risk of hospitalization. Um, Cannabis may contain heavy metals and affect consumer health. Uh, marijuana linked to heart disease. Um, UN Commission reclassifies, but still considered harmful. Marijuana use may cause cognitive impairment even when no longer high. Mar smoking marijuana can cause risk of lung disease, chest scans indicate. Long-term study reveals harm in regular cannabis use. It's just, what are we doing? That's it. I mean, we're just harming our own citizens. That's it. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Sorry, comments from Chambers. All right, seeing no further questions, sorry, seeing no further comment from Chambers, we will move forward with our agenda. With that, we move on to item number seven. Reports from committees and or officers. Do any of our council members have any uh, Reports from any committee events or any participation within the community that you wish to share with the rest of us. Councilman uh, Campos. 
Uh, Madam Mayor, I'll keep my comments brief. So Ben Franklin Transit, we met and uh, staff is looking at putting out a equitable study um, fair increases. They're not increasing their rates. They're trying to get public comment. So for those people who are out in the public who are interested about rates and fares for BFT, uh, stay tuned and provide whatever feedback is necessary. So that was the, the heavy hitter on that topic. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Roach. Uh, Mayor, I attended uh, the access event for um, Martin Luther King uh, Day. It was um, a good turnout was uh, focused on kids and activities and books for them uh, to educate on the day and civil rights um, attended by a lot of our um, Pasco African American community, uh, Miss Vanessa Moore and Mr. Leonard Moore. Um, it was just a really good good event. Yeah, enjoyed it. All right, thank you. Robert Maloney, do you have any comments to share? Not at this time. Thank you for that. Um, I will share real quick, um, and we'll turn to um, our interim city manager. Um, PASCO has a unique opportunity to participate in the NLC, the National League of Cities, with several of the projects that um, We've been, um, I'll say we, as part of staff, uh, that PASCO has been uh, spearheading as far as outstanding projects in regards to housing, our downtown, um, our overpass. Um, along with uh, Jacob Gonzalez, um, PASCO has been selected to be one of five cities to participate in this national recognition um, in the pacific northwest it's only pasco and gresham in oregon then you have um texas you have adam remind uh, me yeah sorry mayor i'm trying to pull up the the cities that are included here texas the... new york and georgia yeah that's that's right um so we are a we have a unique opportunity to really highlight um, city of Pasco and all our, our our projects. Director White, is there anything that you wish to add to what I just mentioned? I'll just add the name of it: the 2023 Mayor's Institute on Advancing Community Revitalization to Improve Health and Equity. Thank you, Madam Mayor. No, I don't. It was very rewarding, though, the session we attended, and I was very impressed by the National League of Cities and their staff, and I'm looking forward to particularly the next half of half of the year. Yeah. So, again, it's something that I'm very proud, staff is very proud that City of Pasco was selected and will be participating in that. Um, and that's all I have to share. Anything else? Any other council members wish to share? Um, Councilwoman Roach. Yes, sorry about that. I forgot that Hanford Communities Governing Board is uh, voting on its uh, agenda for the year. And so wanted to share out uh, the agenda. So I'll send that to Interim City Manager Lincoln. And if any council members have opinions or comment on the agenda, right now it's just a laundry list, but we're going to order it in uh, by priority, rank it. So if you have comments, I know some of you work out there or have worked out there and have some input on that, so I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Mayor Pertemeloni, I think I already asked you. Um, maybe you remi remembered if you have anything else you want to share or add. Nope, still nothing to add at this time. Thank you. All right, so we will move forward with our agenda items. Uh, item B, we will now turn over to uh, Chief gear um, for the Benton Franklin Behavioral Health Advisory Committee update. Madam, <clears throat> excuse me, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, yes, we've been asked to uh, give you a little update on what's going on with the Behavioral Health Advisory Committee. And I have with me tonight uh, Deputy County Administrator Matt Rasmussen from Benton County. Um, I got the, had the opportunity to meet Matt a couple years ago when we had to rapidly set up the uh, vaccination site 
at the Benton County Fairgrounds, and he was sort of the contact person. That was the first time we'd come together, and we had a great working relationship through that whole project, and um, it, it was really good there, and, and I'd like to say that he's he's been kind of a real spearhead to keeping this Behavioral Health Advisory Committee pointed in a, in a positive direction. So with that, if John has the slides available, We'll, and we're going to tag team this. So in 2022, Benton and Franklin counties each have implemented the 1% uh, chemical dependency mental health sales tax. Um, and with the revenues from that tax to be community centered with a range of public perspectives provided to inform the county's decision. And again, the Behavioral Health Committee is, is sort of that public representation to that committee. Uh, I got to find the right got to find the right slide here come on now doesn't it move ahead with yeah, space bar okay John <laughs> try the down arrows. there we go <laughs> <laughs> following the tax implementation of Benton Franklin Behavioral Health Advisory Committee was established by joint resolution of the boards of Benton County and Franklin County Commissioners and the committee consists of 17 volunteer members with three-year terms to provide perspective on the need and effectiveness of behavioral health services in the region so I must be doing something. The committee, here's the advisory committee makeup. Um, I won't read through everyone, but uh, you can see there's law enforcement, fire EMS, hospital, mental health, uh, persons with lived experience, uh, general public. And we also established after the first meeting that we'd like to have a tie-breaking 17th uh, member, with, which was a person, again, with lived experience. That's the core of the Behavioral Health Advisory Committee. And then there's non-voting members. In addition to the 17 voting members, we have the Benton County Administrator, who actually is represented by Matt, Franklin County Administrator, which has been Dwayne Davidson over the last few months um, after uh, Mr. Johnson left, Benton County Human Services Manager, Benton Franklin Health District Administrator, the Superior Court, District Court, and Recovery Coalition President. So it's a fairly large group, and that, that doesn't always get you very far. Uh, sometimes the more the members on the committee, the harder it is to get things done. Um, the behavioral health, our charter is, we exist to gather community input and advise the Benton and Franklin County boards of county commissioners how best to spend the revenues gener generated by the sales tax. This, is include, this includes, but it's not limited to, make recommendations on contracts to provide behavioral health services, um, this includes selection of providers and ongoing monitoring of the services performed. And I think Matt's going to talk about the provider selection process that we're in right now. Have input on the design and construction of behavioral health facilities under the jurisdiction of the counties. And as you've heard, there has been movement ahead on facilities. And again, Matt's going to talk about that portion. Uh, make recommendations for new services or services that need to be expanded. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet because we really don't even have a lot of the basic services, much less getting very far into, into other services. And then make recommendations on services that are not effective, not utilized, or need to be adjusted. And I think that's the last, oh, excuse me, this is my last slide. So meetings of the Behavioral Health Advisory Committee began on September 8th. They're held the second Thursday of the month, um, 2 to 3.30 at the uh, Benton, or excuse me, the front, uh, yes, the Benton County Administrative Building, uh, which is on the Justice Center campus, right between the Justice Center and the Health District. Um, and then we have four subgroups that we put together um, to help establish some standards for mental health services, standards for sub substance abuse services, um, communications as the committee gets moving forward, getting the message out to the, to the public on what's going on with that, and then a behavioral health workforce development. One of the things that I think many of us have seen that have been involved in the whole behavioral health, um, right through just uh, getting our resource navigators at the Pasco Fire Department is, there's a real shortage of workers to do behavioral health work and community health work. Um, we've had a real hard time keeping those positions filled. Um, they're not the very highest paying jobs, and there just isn't a lot of people in, in, the, in the field. It's a, been an interesting problem because very rarely do you have a problem and have money, but we don't have anybody in the middle to, to get it done. And that's really where this whole behavioral health, mental health, substance abuse, we're just lacking people in the middle. Uh, so with that, unless there's any questions on my first part, I'll turn it over to Matt for this next portion. Yeah, thanks, Chief. Um, we can... 
Uh, well, now the slide in. <laughs> good deal. Now I have to have to bring your slide back. Yeah. What do you need? The next slide. The next slide. Oh, well, well, okay. It shouldn't be the last slide. That's all right. I can uh, I can just talk about. So I was going to first update the council a little bit on uh, one of the main projects that the committee is working on, which is the Behavioral Health Recovery Center. And so this has been a community, uh, community conversation that's been going on for probably close to two or three decades about the need for these services here. But they took the real, a real big first step back in 2020 in October in a, uh, the counties of Benton, Benton and Franklin County grouped together along with the Benton Franklin Recovery Coalition and the uh, Kennewick Hospital District. And they did a feasibility study that identified the old KGH hospital as a potential location for some of these behavioral health services. So after that feasibility study was completed, um, Benton County stepped up and said that we would take the, take the lead on going and negotiating uh, with the owner, which was LifePoint Health at the time, for that, pro for that property. So we began those negotiations in April of 2021. Um, it took a little over a year to uh, complete those negotiations. We uh, completed those in 2022 in June. And during that time, we were also successful in lobbying the Washington State Legislature for some grant funding to help assist with the purchase of that property. Um, as part of the final negotiations, I'm sure the council has heard, um, there was some restrictions that the uh, owner placed on that property specifically related to inpatient mental health services. So that's anybody who comes into the facility who's diagnosed with a mental health condition, they cannot remain in that facility for longer than 72 hours. So for the counties, that was a concern because if we had a patient who came in and needed to stay longer than that three days, we would have to find another home for them, and another facility, and I'm sure the council is aware right now there are no other facilities. That's why we have some of the problems we have. So be, having to remove someone arbitrarily from that facility to Benton <laughs> County was not an option. So that, uh, that forced us to go and seek out a second location to be able to have those mental health services that would be subject to that restriction. So we uh, began looking for another facility right around that time. Um, during, during that process, we took uh, possession of the KGH facility. We still felt that that was a good purchase for the counties. There's a lot of programs and services that can be had there that still has a great value for what we paid for it. So in November of 22, we closed uh, the purchase of that facility. And then right around that same time, we concluded uh, negotiations for a lease for a second facility. And then, unfortunately, I don't have my slides with some pictures that I had of each of those. But uh, so around that same time, so we acquired a second facility for uh, to house those services that we could not house at the KGH property. So um, a little bit of the vision of what we're trying to provide uh, for that recovery center. So the term we use is called, it's a no wrong door facility. So what we want is a place where law enforcement, EMS, uh, family members, or people can just walk in and they're gonna get the services that they need, be it mental health services, substance use disorder services, or a combination of the two. We want a one-stop shop facility. They walk in the door, there's a professional there who can assess them and point them to the correct service within that same building. There's no saying, hey, you need to go down the street here or you need to go to the hospital over there. You walk in the door, you're gonna get the services that you need. It's a model that I've seen. I've been to a few different facilities all over the West Coast and looked at it. I think it's a really great model. I think there's some a lot of people who have heard about this and it, it really, it really prevents the providers from pushing somebody on to the next service and make sure that people get the treatment that they need when they come in. That would be done on a 24 hour a day, seven day a week basis. It'd be for walk-ins and law enforcement EMS drop-offs, both voluntary and involuntary clients. So people who are not being cooperative, there's still a process of which law enforcement can bring them in and they will be brought into that facility and get the treatment that they need. And it serves mostly as an alternative to incarceration or trips to the emergency room. Right now, those are the two options that are afforded to our first responders. If they have somebody who's under the influence or having a mental health crisis, they really can only either take them to jail or take them to the hospital emergency room. And neither of those are good options for people in that condition. So that's, that's what we're trying to create here with the recovery center. So we're building it in phases. Um, the first phase is made up of two main components and that's your crisis stabilization. So that consists of three subparts. One of those is a 23 hour observation unit. That's basically a large room with recliner chairs and maybe some beds where people can come in. They stay less than 24 hours for the 23 hours and 59 minutes, but they call it a 23 hour observation. And they come in, they stay in there for that one day period. They get an assessment 
to determine what their needs are and what their treatment level should be. Sometimes it's just they need to be there for that time frame. They need to calm down, get out of their crisis, and then they're sent out, referred to outpatient. Other times they're admitted into the crisis stabilization unit. That's the longer stay. That can be 5, 14, or 90 days, depending on uh, what court orders come up or if they meet medical needs, if they're there in an involuntary or a voluntary process. Or they may be sent to the detox unit. So that's uh, secure withdrawal management is the official title, but most people know it as detox. And so that's a, it's a voluntary or involuntary, secure or non-secure, but that's people who are un actively under the uh, influence of drugs or alcohol. They go in there, they get cleaned out, cleaned up, they get to where they can uh, interact with the, with the providers, and then they make a determination on what treatment level they need to have beyond that. Um, for future phases of the recovery center, there's a lot of discussion going on at the committee level. Those include uh, having a place for outpatient services. So there's a lot of square footage that's available in these facilities. So we may be looking at leasing space to providers who want to provide outpatient services. Um, there's a tremendous need in the state and the region for youth-related crisis and long-term inpatient services. So there's discussion around having those there and then also some discussion around having housing. So uh, recovery housing for people who are coming out of long-term inpatient treatment, a lot of the times they don't have any resources to fall back on. So having a housing component where they can come and stay for a temporary basis, get some job training skills, life skills, and those kind of things, and then integrate them back into the community, that's another tremendous need in the community that uh, is being discussed. So the two facilities we have, obviously, are the old Kennewick General Hospital. We also refer to it as the 900 South Auburn facility. Right now, there's 193,000 square feet of available space there and about eight and a half acres of property, some of which could be developed into additional buildings if needed. So um, like I said, there's a lot of things that we've discussed, but they are subject to that, uh, that restriction. I think probably everybody here is familiar with the Kennewick General, the old hospital, and has an idea of what it looks like, but uh, certainly a lot of uh, value there in what there is. The other facility is located at 10 East Bruno Avenue, and so that's... Uh, just off um, Columbia Drive and Washington Street there. It's near the public, the new public market that's open. The county leased a 20,000 or 22,000 square foot facility, but it is expandable up to about 40,000 square feet on the inside. We could add a second floor inside of there and increase that square footage. It is an old warehouse, not pretty right now, but it, with the uh, right work and the upgrades to it, it, it could be transformed into a world-class uh, behavioral health center. So. So right now, the current, the current plan, and this was discussed a little bit at the, uh, the last committee meeting here last week, is we would locate those crisis stabilization components at that Bruno Avenue facility. So those are the, any component that involves a mental health or mental health or potential mental health uh, issue. So that way we avoid that 72-hour covenant on the KGH property. We aren't subject to that. It keeps those no wrong door services together. So that way anybody who comes to that facility can be referred into the treatment they need. The law enforcement officers don't have to think about which door, which building they need to take them to or wonder, you know, does this guy have behavioral health or a mental health issue or a substance use issue? They have one place to go. They can drop them there and get back to what they need to do. Um, it may, so, and then it also has room for expansion. As we talked about, it's 22,000 expandable up to 40,000. And then the second component that we would want to have of this uh, program is called residential inpatient substance use treatment. And that's your longer term substance use treatment uh, facility. That's where people are staying for 60 or 90 days and getting fully treated for their substance use addiction. And that is not subject to any covenant at the KGH property. So we would likely locate that there. It's a follow up to the crisis services, but not necessarily a um, not necessarily it doesn't necessarily need to be immediately located with them. By the time people are going to that residential setting, it's a mostly a voluntary action. They can be driven there by a family member or one of the providers of the main facility can take them over there. It doesn't require a secure transport. So we think that would work pretty well. That, that also allows us to easily expand that residential component. If there's more beds needed than the initial phase, there's a lot of room there at KGH. And that's a tremendous need in, in Benton and Franklin counties right now. The Tri-Cities is the only major metropolitan area in the state of Washington that does not have residential treatment services. And so that's, that's, a, that's a big thing for us. And then as we discussed, uh, future phases would be 
youth, youth uh, crisis and inpatient mental health. So that's a clip that we're commonly known as a clip facility, recovery housing, uh, respite housing, outpatient and community and group services. So as part of this first phase, the county um, has been working on a request for proposals to get a provider in there to for do those crisis stabilization services and the residential uh, inpatient substance use. So we put out an RFP in November of 2022. Uh, it then required all of those services. We were trying to get them all under one contract. So we had a single provider for all of those services. We only received one response for that. So we brought that back to the Behavioral Health Advisory Committee and asked for their in input on how should the counties proceed. The committee suggested that we look at revising that proposal and reissuing it. They would like to see more than one provider to choose from. And so we took that back to the commissioners. The commissioners agreed and we revised that RFP and it was actually reissued today. And so now it has the ability for the providers to submit on one or all of the uh, four components of the recovery center. So that hopefully will open that up. It will require a little more or coordination for the counties to make sure those providers, if we end up with multiple providers, are working together. But it is possible to do, and we're hopeful that that will bring in uh, some, extra, some extra companies who want to do that work here in the community. Um, responses to that RFP are due March 3rd, and then we'll be bringing that back to the advisory committee once we get those responses. Hopefully we'll have more than one this time, and we'll have a good and thorough review process of those, and then work through a contract, and hopefully by the middle of this year, we'll have a provider or providers under contract, and we can start really getting into the design of those facilities. Bringing the provider on and having them be a part of the design team is something we all felt was very important. Nobody knows better how to design a facility than the person who's going to have to run it. And so that was an important component for us. Um, and then the county's also working on a potential RFP for a recovery housing provider. So that's what we've talked about. Um, there's a lot of space there at KGH, so recovery housing is a need that we've looked at. And so we're putting together a draft RFP to look at get, bringing in a provider who would operate that housing component on behalf of the counties. And uh, the last piece I had is um, a little bit of a discussion on the funding. So, so far we've collected $16.3 million in funding for the recovery center project. Uh, Five million of that is coming from Benton County. We've set aside some of the ARPA allocation that we received directly to behavioral health programs. That was an eligible use for us. We thought that was a, an, easy, uh, an easy sell for the community and that's what our commissioners wanted to do. Um, two million of that came from a congressional directed spending grant from the federal government that we got in 20, 2022. And then the remaining money is from a combination of state uh, competitive grants and uh, legislative directives to the county for those pr uh, programs. I had a breakdown of that. Unfortunately, I don't have the slides. Uh, but happy to send it over and share it with the council if you'd like to see it. So that is all I had, but I'm absolutely happy to have any questions. Thank you for that, very thorough. Um, would have wanted to see those slides. Uh, we do have a question from Councilwoman Roach. Yes, thank you for the presentation. And definitely if we can get those slides, that would be uh, appreciated. I just wanted clarification. Um, you said two different things that seem to conflict with one another about the KGH building. So there's a 72 hour restriction on somebody who's having a mental health episode. Is that accurate? It's anything that has to be inpatient mental health. So if you had to be admitted for treatment that you would stay, you know, inpatient technically means more than one night. So if you had to stay more than one night, we, we would not be able to keep someone there who had a mental health diagnosis for more than 72 hours. Then we would have to locate them to a new facility so if they were at KGH. Is the KGH building, um, is it manageable to have the substance abuse inpatient program there? Does that, is that classified as a, entirely different yeah, the substance abuse is not subject to that because they would only be there for substance abuse treatment not they would have a substance use abuse primary not necessarily the mental health primary so even though it could be co-occurring their diagnosis would be substance use and therefore that's so be. interesting because mental and behavioral health issues are like this and right. so it, it doesn't make sense to probably lay people who aren't in the know of the distinction between the two um, the other question that I had was about the square footage of the, the buildings. Um, in the assessment that the advisory committee has, has made in reviewing this, do one or the other facility meet the square footage needs? Is one shy or 
are they enough to have the the no wrong door um, approach so we've looked at the various facilities that we've toured and the for each of the components of that no wrong door approach they range from eight to fifteen thousand square feet for a facility and so we believe that the the Bruno Street facility, which could be up to 40,000 square feet, can house those three components, the crisis stabilization, the 23-hour observation, and the detox can be housed there. There's enough space to house those there. And then KGH obviously has ample square footage to house the, the uh, inpatient residential and then uh, any other programs that we uh, think need to be there. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions or comments from okay. council? Um, Councilman Brown. More of a question slash comment. Thank you. I was really there on major data download, but um, I think I'm hearing kind of a connection with wraparound services. Um, so my question would be, is that, has that been considered? Because with these services, all that's going to be provided, there's some extended help or assistance that's going to be needed. So has there been conversation about wraparound services, community-based, um, some of our religious organizations, family members, police officers. Has that been a part of the conversation? We, we definitely talked about it at a higher level. Um, those, are, those details will really come into how when we start negotiating with a provider and talking to them about what the expectation is for them. But the RFP does contain language that says the provider who operates this is going to be responsible to make sure that they are connecting uh, people from the facility when they're released with those wraparound services for that continuing care they have to develop a, pl a care plan for them then then get them con connected with those out uh, outpatient and wraparound services afterwards but we'll have a lot more detailed discussion at the committee level and with the contractor once we have a provider who we've selected no i appreciate it. i would love to see that in there um that short term is great but there's some long-term issues that you know is attached to that and if yep. we can be of great help on the long term to really get to the root of it th that would be really helpful Absolutely. with all involved with wraparound services they're very um, community-based family-based mm -hmm. religion-based all those things will be very very helpful to get to the root cause of why they're in this predicament so That's we it. can help so thank you if that can be considered that would be great any further questions or comments? Councilman Serrano. Yeah, just, um, so uh, he's spoken and uh, earlier, our sheriff, he's unlike Teddy Roosevelt, who said to speak softly and carry a big stick. He carries a big stick and also speaks very loudly. He's been very critical of the partnership of uh, Benton and Franklin counties. And, and I'm not going to put words into his mouth, but just from what I've read, um, and I've admittedly not reached out to him about his experience. Uh, can you address the partnership between the two counties and how that's functioning presently? Oh, um, we, you know, we've heard all the, the comments that the sheriff has made and, and as a result of some comments a couple of weeks ago, we started reaching out more heavily to the Franklin County commissioners and engaging with them to say, you know, where, where is Franklin County really on these issues? We hear what's going on in, in the public comment section of your meetings, but what are the commissioners thinking? And so my understanding is the commissioners are wanting to move forward with this partnership relationship that we've discussed. Um, we're going to start having free or regular bi-county meetings. So I think we all agreed that it would be quarterly. The first one will be coming up here probably maybe the end of February when we can get all the commissioners together. So that way we can start discussing in an open public setting how does this relationship look and what we are moving forward? It seems like there's a strong desire on both sides to move forward with a relationship. I think we all recognize, though, that as time progresses and Franklin County and you know, Pasco grow, there's going to be a need for those services on this side of the river, too. You know, this facility we're going to build is going to fill up rather quickly. There's a huge community need. It's not one facility is not going to solve that for a, a population of 300,000, which will be four or 500,000 in 10 to 15 years. So I think that's what we would need to have discussions between the two commissions is what does this look like? There's a short term, what can we build right now? And then there's a longer term look about what are the bigger and the future expansion of those facilities look like? So I think the partnership is good. The Franklin County commissioners I've spoken to want to move forward and continue those discussions. And that's what we're going to start doing. And I might add that, yes, there may be a need in the future for additional facilities, but we've got to 
we've got to remember that there is very limited number of people to provide these facilities and trying to duplicate facilities in multiple locations is just not simply not going to work in the short term until more people can get through programs and training and, and be able to fill these jobs. They, they just aren't out there. Okay, so just so I fully understand, um, and again, having read and having heard and having caught off the cuff comments, the primary concern as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to be that the, the facilities are primarily or are targeted in Benton County, and therefore, uh, you know, it, it creates an extra burden or whatever the problem is of, of shipping folks from Franklin County. Um, are there any other operational concerns that we ought be aware of uh, where, you know, the people of Pasco specifically, uh, not even branching out to the county, but our residents um, will somehow receive uh, less services or, or, or is that a concern chief from your perspective? It's not a concern from my perspective because many of these people we see have multiple addresses in both counties and move back and forth fairly regularly. Um, probably 90% of the people that we see. Um, the people that are, I don't know if it's the right word to use it, but suffering with behavioral health issues that are in somewhat of a stable environment, like in a home somewhere where someone's ta a caregiver's taking care of them. Um, those aren't the ones that, that are the issue that we see on the street. The people on the street go back and forth, and, and we see it with our resource navigators where they, they have to go to Richland to make a contact with a person that has already caused six calls in Pasco in the last two months, but right now is living in Richland and or living in Kennewick. Um, so these people are pretty mobile. It, it's surprising how much they get around. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I think the step one is having a facility within the Tri-Cities, right? And, and then branching out to serving the population's need of our city, of our community. And that's step two. Thank you. I will say just add one couple things. One, I got to apologize to Matt because I must have grabbed the wrong slide deck, which is where it in. And um, sent those to John, but we'll get the whole slide deck out to council so you have his information. Um, the the other thing is that um, one of the things I, I was not able to attend last week's meeting because I had a, a conflict meeting with in Ellensburg, but um, the committee did step up and, and try and pick, I guess, the right to me, the right term is some low-hanging fruit that we can get started right away, and, and that's getting the uh, mobile response capability out there. Um, it's not perfect because we don't have anywhere to take the people other than the jail or hospital after the mobile response, but even if we get started with some diffusing in a mobile response setup, it's better than what we have right now. I think there were three or four items, Matt, that came out of that meeting that, that you might... Yeah, so we, we did discuss the mobile response. Um, the law enforcement and EMS uh, representatives were tasked with going back to their groups and asking them about their needs and preferences for what mobile response would look like. Is that an independent team? Is it a behavioral health expert embedded with the EMS or law enforcement? So have those discussions and come back to the committee so that we can start working on forming a recommendation uh, to fund that. Um, another uh, another item that was discussed is having a need for an um, emergency prescriber. So a lot of people have an issue getting their medications. They can't get in to see their, their doctor or their regular provider. They have an emergency need to get their prescription filled. We could potentially have a contract with a prescriber who could fill those on a short-term basis you know, so that they weren't waiting three weeks to get an appointment to get a prescription renewed. They could get a short-term uh, renewal of that and that helped people who need those medications help keep them stable and uh, and keep them out of dealing with our law enforcement and first responders another item that we discussed um, was the need for respite housing so that's like a one night stay for people who are in crisis need a need a place just to be safe and, and unwind so that was another item that we discussed that would need some space but it's a small uh, small space need there's obviously plenty of room at the KGH building so we have a team there from the committee who's going to explore what the needs are for that, how much that would cost to come back, and we can formulate a recommendation on whether or not that should be stood up at the uh, KGH facility. And I'm trying to remember what the uh, what the fourth item was that we discussed. Kyle, do you remember the fourth one? Yeah, I think I so. <laughs> anyway, we had those three. There was another another one that we uh, talked about that was something that could be stood up relatively short amount of time and 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 low cost investment that would fill a need in the community. Thank you. Um, Mayor Patemaloni, do you have any questions or comments? Yes, I'll be brief. Um, I, I like what I'm hearing in terms of uh, the diverse set of services that our community needs. Um, 
I, I do echo the concerns that that um, I want to make sure that our residents are well served, um, and the devil's being the details on that. Right now, I, I, the question I have is: Are the counties currently operating entirely separately on this in terms of both sets of commissioners have to make a vote to to enact this, or are they working as a with an interlocal agreement wherein there is a they are voting together? How how functionally are the counties making decisions as opposed to the advisory board functioning? So currently, the counties are operating independently with what they what they do. Uh, the advisory board will come back and report to both county both sets of county commissioners. Um, so far, the advisory board hasn't done any formal recommendations other than the discussion on the RFP. Uh, Benton County was driving that process, so that was only an action by the Benton County commissioners. Um, but yeah, the the goal is is that as we stand up some of these services we would look at interlocal agreements to operate those so that the count the commissioners would be working t in tandem on these but when you're doing a lot of these services it's better to have a, a lead agency and then the other eight the, and then the partner agencies have an agreement with that rather than five agencies trying to work with one contractor that makes logistical very challenging so that's the discussion that we've had is there'll be a lead agency it may be franklin county in some instances and so i think those discussions will happen as we get these services uh, stood up, as these recommendations come forward from the committee with what should be done with that one tenth of one percent sales tax revenue, and then we'll have individual agreements for these services on how the two counties interact together. And sometimes it may be more than just Benton and Franklin County. I mean, this is a regional need. It, it serves we can serve Yakima and Adams and Grant and Walla Walla and all the surrounding counties as well. So. And I might point out that the. RCWs pertaining to interlocal agreements require that there is a lead agency within the agent signatory agencies to the ILA, but one agency does need to be the lead agency, technically the treasurer uh, or a host agency. So they, when at the point that we have to uh, or that we need to develop ILAs, um, that lead agency would have to be developed for whatever that ILA is intended for. Great, thank you. Any further questions, uh, Mayor Pertamaloni? No, I'll, I'm interested in a little more clarification on that. I, I understood all the words you said, but um, seeing the two counties function entirely, you know, kind of, kind of independently and have to negotiate each individual set of services or facilities sounds like a, a, a massive burden. Uh, so I'd, I'd be interested in understanding why we can't form a joint agency, um, a cooperation where, where, where there's a, a different agency set up with members of both counties. But um, I, I can follow up with Chief Gear later on that. Okay. Thank you. Councilwoman Roach. Thank you. Um, just looking for a quick recap because I heard you cite a number of different uh, dollar amounts and where they were coming from. Uh, my understanding is the one tenth of one percent is not for capital projects. And so that's simply for operations and actual program services. But what what is reserved for the capital part of this uh, so, yeah, expense? You're, you're correct. The one tenth of one percent is for operations only. Um, so capital, we've been seeking grant funding and appropriations from the legislature and from the federal government. And so um, I can recap those or I can I'd probably rather just send you the, the spreadsheet that I have that tracks all of those. So there's a combination of county money. Um, a good portion of that has come from grants and appropriations from the state through their behavioral health facilities program. And then we did get a small uh, federal grant as well. And I think your slide, Matt, is that's pretty much capital available money right. that came from other than the one tenth of one percent. There's no money for the capital that's being proposed out of the one tenth of one percent. Is there enough to purchase the the property from we've that? We've fund? already purchased the KGH property. It's already been bought. And the downtown one is is already under a lease, and the county is paying for that as well. Okay. So. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? It sounds like you were very thorough. Thank you again for sharing the information. Chief, we know that if we're going to have more questions, we're going to come straight to you. Um, but I think a lot of the information that you shared and maybe the answer to a lot of our questions will be in those slides as well. Okay. This, we'll get the secret slides to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we move on to our next item on the agenda, um, item eight, hearings and council action on ordinances and resolutions relating thereto, none listed. Item nine, ordinance, ordinances and resolutions not relating to hearings. We have item A, 
uh, an ordinance number 4633, approval of Montez rezone uh, from R2 to R4, R4. And Director White, we have you as a presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And just briefly, this uh, proposed rezone, as you mentioned, is uh, currently zoned R2. The proposal is to rezone it to R4. It's a little less than five acres. It's located on the east side of Cedar, just south, as you can see, uh, of Lewis Street. The hearing, Pasco Hearing Examiner conducted a public hearing on this proposal in December and has forwarded a recommendation of approval for Council's consideration. Thank you for that. Do we have any questions or comments from Council regarding this um, item? Madam Mayor, if, if I may, because it's a quasi-judicial matter, if I can go through the script real quick, that'd be appreciated. Uh, this is a quasi-judicial hearing uh, to render a final decision on the materials presented. It's defined as a proceeding in which the Council defines the legal rights, duties, and privileges of specific parties in the hearing or other contested proceeding. The appearance of fairness doctrine applies, uh, which means the hearing must be fair in three respects, form, substance, and appearance. All council members should consider whether they have potential conflicts as follows, a demonstrated bias for or against any of the parties, any direct or indirect financial interest in the outcome of the proceeding, whether there has been any prejudgment of the issues prior to the hearing, whether there has been any ex parte contact with anyone other than staff prior to this hearing, and finally, any other conflict with the, which a council member believes would prevent them from hearing this matter fairly and impartially. If there are any council members that have any disclosures, now would be the time to make those known. Hearing none, there, are there any members of the public wishing to seek to disqualify a member of council on this matter? Seeing none, please proceed. Thank you. Again, thank you for the reminder. Uh, moving forward, do we have any questions or comments on this item? Mayor Pertemeloni, any questions or comments? No, at this time. So, hearing none, I will uh, defer back to Councilman Campos for a motion. I move to adopt ordinance number 4633, approving a rezone at 131 South Cedar Avenue from R2, medium density residential to R4, high density residential, and further authorized publication by summary only. There's a motion. Can I get a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Brown. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, it moves forward. Thank you. And we move on to our item B. Again, another quasi judicial matter. Uh, ordinance number 4634, approval, approval of ICCU rezone from RT to C1. And again, Director White. Thank you again, Madam Mayor and Council. And this rezone is uh, from residential transition <clears throat> to C1. Um, the uh, hearing examiner again conducted a public hearing on this proposal in December. The site is approximately two acres. It's located at the southeast corner of Road 68 and Three Rivers Drive, which isn't yet built, uh, but it will be extended uh, both with uh, development of this parcel and uh, the parcel uh, labeled R4 to the east. Uh, the uh, public hearing was held. Uh, the hearing examiner recommended uh, approval of this rezone request for council's consideration. Thank you for that. Mr. And um, thank you again, Madam Mayor. Uh, the same disclosures as previously mentioned would apply to this matter as well. Uh, are there any council members uh, that have uh, disclosures that need to be made at this time? Seeing none. Are there any members of the public uh, seeking to disqualify a member of the council from participating in this proceeding? Seeing none, please proceed. Thank you. Any questions or comments on this issue? Mayor Pertemeloni, any questions or comments? None at this time. Hearing none, uh, Councilman Campos, can I get a motion? I move to adopt ordinance number 4634, approving a rezone from RT, residential transition to C1, Retail Business District, and further authorized publication by summary only. There's a motion. Can I get a second? All seconded. Seconded by Councilmember Milne. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? And that was an aye for Mayor Pertemeloni, correct? Yes, that was an aye. 
Thank you. And it passes unanimously. Thank you again. With that, we move on to our next item on the agenda, item C, resolution number 4300 and ordinance number 4635, change order number 11 for the West Pasco Water Treatment Plant and Budget Amendment. Director Worley. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of Council. Uh, as is typical for myself, I would like to turn this over <laughs> to Deputy Public Works Director Maria Serra. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. We are presenting to you a change order, change order number 11 for West Pasco treatment plan, uh, water treatment plan expansion project phase one. Uh, this project was partially funded with Department of Health funding, it's a low interest loan on water rates. Um, we had contingency plan on the project, yet through the previous 10 change orders, we have exhausted that, um, uh, well actually, with the first 10 change orders that were minor, plus this 11th change order that is being proposed, we would have expanded all our contingency. So we are, along with this change order, requesting approval, also asking for a budget amendment uh, for increasing the budget for this project. Now, along those lines, we did reach out to the Department of Health to know whether they would have some additional funds to help us fund the shortfall in the project. And there appears to be some funding available. So we will be working with them to get that additional funding contracted. But we want to um, account for those funds in our budget. So that's why the ordinance is still in front of you. Um, as far as the technical details of the change order, we do have a construction manager Kent McHugh online to uh, explain a little bit more the details of the change order itself. And we provided an additional exhibit uh, that didn't make it into the agenda report in just a printout that um, the clerk has shared with you or will be sharing with you uh, right now while Kent McHugh explains the details. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon. Good evening. Can you hear me? You got you. We can hear you. Go Can ahead. you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, as uh, Director, Deputy Director Sarah said, uh, my name is Kent McHugh. I am your construction manager, and I'm here to present the technical um, aspect of this change order. Um, as you may, may or may not recall, phase one project consists of the first set of improvements to expand the production capacity of the West Pasco water treatment plant from six to 12 million gallons the installation of membrane treatment units, uh, residual systems involving a clarifier and a new pump station building um, upgrades to the SCADA system and other plant improvements. Um, during the uh, design phase, we had contracted with RH2 to do the engineer of record design. And in August of 2020, we were walking the plant, looking at different existing appurtenances to try to figure out what could be reused, what could not. Um, we happened to look in this raw water vault. It's the first contact vault uh, coming from the Columbia River intake that um, is actually the first point of treatment. And um, uh, once we opened the vault, we realized, or we looked in there and looked like there was a fair amount of the uh, existing piping, um, the quill injection system and so forth that could be reused. And so we determined that we were going to go ahead and reuse this as part of the project. The one problem with it, that um, observation was we were not able to actually gain full access to the vault because it would have been a confined space entry and looking at it from ground level, it looked like everything seemed to be somewhat satisfactory. So we put the uh, project out to a bid, awarded it to, to Apollo in uh, uh, February of 22. Um, once we got the vault lid off and we actually got into the vault, we realized that there was significant corrosion to the existing piping due to some uh, basically bleach leaks over the years for, uh, at this injection system. So we determined that the, we needed to replace um, the entire piping and uh, rework this whole project. So, um, let's see, lost my train of thought here. So once, once we got into this, we realized we uh, saw some areas that we could do some improvements with the design and chose to do so, and it consists of a 
uh, two chemical feed injection ports or oriented for full functionality, a flood sensor so that we know if there's any future leaks in the in the future, we're able to get on top of them and be able to correct them before there's any uh, extensive damage as we experienced since the plant started up in 2010. Access uh, hatch intrusion sensors, chemical resistant pipe coatings, Teflon co coated bolts for all pipes and hardwares, et cetera. So the uh, proposed change order is $405,827.56. And um, I'm here for any questions that you may have. Thank you for that, um, Mr. McHugh, correct? Yes. Any questions uh, from council regarding this subject? Mayor Pertamaloni, do you have any questions or comments? I have no questions at this time. Okay, with that, can I get a motion? I move to approve resolution number 4300 authorizing the interim city manager to execute change order number 11 to the construction contract with Apollo Inc. for the West Pasco water treatment improvements phase one project. I'll second that. There's a motion and seconded by Councilwoman Roach. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And it passes unanimously. And there's a second motion. Yeah. Madam Mayor. I move to adopt ordinance number 4635, amending the 2023-2024 capital projects biennial budget, ordinance number 4620, by providing supplement thereto to provide additional appropriation in the city's water fund for the West Pasco Water Treatment Plant Phase 1 project and future authorized publication by summary only. There's a motion. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Second it again by Councilwoman Roach. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. It passes unanimously. Thank you for that. So moving on to item number, item D on our agenda, resolution number 4301 and ordinance number 4636, amendment number one, to the pre-construction funding agreement with the Department of Ecology for the wastewater treatment plant improvements phase one and two and budget adjustment. Director Worley. Thank you again, Madam Mayor. I will once again defer to Deputy Public Works Director for Engineering, Maria Sarah. Should we just change the agenda and add uh, <laughs> her name on there? <laughs> Probably. I'm joking. Thank you. Good evening again. Uh, this item we are presenting to you actually is to amend a funding agreement with the Department of Ecology. If you remember uh, in 2021, we signed an agreement with the Department of Ecology to provide funding for the design of phases one and two of wastewater treatment plant. And that agreement had a clear scope of work. And we had some activities that were required through permitting and some rebidding that we had to do, uh, which were not clearly stated in that agreement. There were costs that were excluded from that, that agreement uh, concurrent with that scope. Uh, after consulting with them, there were funds available and they were willing to amend our contract to be able to cover those eligible costs that had been previously excluded. This amendment increases our award from Ecology for this project in the, in the order of $600,000. And what we are presenting to you is the amendment to that agreement and uh, an ordinance to reflect that additional revenue for our project um, in, the, in the budget. And I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. Any questions or comments from council regarding this subject? Yes. Mayor Pertamaloni, any questions or comments? No questions or comments at this time. Thank you for that. And Councilman Campos, can I get a motion, please? Uh, Madam Mayor, I move to approve resolution number 4301, authorizing the interim city manager to execute amendment number one to the water quality combined financial assistance agreement with the Department of Ecology for wastewater treatment plant phases one and two projects. There's a motion. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Seconded by Council Member uh, Serrano. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Moves forward. And we have a second motion. 
I move to adopt ordinance number 4636, amending the 2023-2024 biennial capital projects budget, ordinance number 4620 of the city of Pasco, Washington, by providing supplement thereto to provide additional appropriation in the city's sewer fund for the wastewater treatment plant phases one and two projects, and further authorized publication by summary only. There's a motion. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Seconded by Councilmember Milne. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. And it passes. It passes unanimously. With that, uh, we will be taking a five minute break. Um, we'll return here at 827.
probably working. And we're back from break. With that, we will move on to item number E on the agenda. Item E, resolution number 4302, Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife Mitigation Agreement for the PWRF pretreatment improvements phase two. Director Worley. I know this is going to come as a shocker, but I'm going to turn this over to Maria. <laughs> Good evening again. We are presenting to you an agreement between City of Pasco, Franklin County, and um, the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife for Washington State. Uh, this agreement addresses the needs for mitigation for shrub step disruption within the PWRF Phase 2 project, which is the winter storage ponds that are planned uh, on the parcels north and south of PWRF facility. Um, this need for mitigation was identified as part of our environmental permitting and analysis that was done as part of our acquisition of land from the department, the uh, USBR, the Bureau of Reclamation. And uh, the agreement was developed with Fish and Wildlife and it establishes a cost for acre of shrub step that needs to be mitigated. The mitigation is two acres for each acre that is disturbed. And what this accounts for is to create a bank that is in Franklin County for mitigation that will happen within Franklin County. But the mitigations of several projects can be combined into a bigger, more effective mitigation location. Uh, with that, there are prices established for each for each acre and for this project, for the immediate area that is gonna be disturbed, uh, the amount the city would owe is $180,000. And with that, I am happy to answer questions. I'm trying to keep my presentation brief. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, any questions from council? Mayor Pertamaloni, do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, just briefly, I had some exchanges with um, uh, Interim City Manager Lincoln and um, Director Worley uh, earlier today. Nothing that affects this matter, just trying to figure out um, if there's any way we can more efficiently use this to maybe cultivate open space within the city of Pasco limits. That's something that we've had a number of com uh, community members express interest in. So just, just brainstorming ways that we can, you know, make it make something like this in, more impactful for our, our local community members. Um, but I'll, I'll be in support of this This uh, item in front of us right now. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any further questions or comments from council? Hearing none, uh, Councilman uh, Campos, can I get a motion, please? I move to approve resolution number 4302, authorizing the interim city manager to enter into an agreement for the shrub step impact mitigation for Pasco wastewater reuse facility expansion with Franklin County and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. There's a motion. Can I get a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Brown. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No, no, none opposed. Passes unanimously. Thank you for that. And we move on to um, item 10, unfinished business. Uh, item A on our agenda says resolution number 4303, considerations or retail sales of cannabis, Director White. Director White. Thank you, Madam Mayor and, and Council. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, there's probably not a whole lot to say uh, that hasn't been said on this subject, uh, but after much Council discussion, much public input, and many opportunities for recognizing uh, Council sentiment on this issue, a series of resolutions have been drafted uh, that in, are intended to uh, be followed up by uh, municipal code specific ordinances depending on the options that are chosen. Uh, I thought what I would do is uh, briefly go through the options uh, indicating the highlights. Uh, Mr. Ferguson and I just chatted a minute ago. Um, you will notice that the uh, resolutions pertain to the permit or the zoning districts 
that uh, are uh, listed for permitted retail cannabis activities and whether or not the conditional use process is intended. Uh, those are the primary considerations that are important to bring back to council the specific ordinances depending on what option is chosen. So that's why the resolution just deals with those two issues for the most part. Uh, but motion A, the first motion on the agenda report, uh, identifies retail cannabis as an outright permitted use in the C2, C3, I1, I2, and I3 zoning districts. Motion B identifies the I zones, 1, 2, and 3, as uh, opportunities for retail cannabis through the conditional use permit process. Again, the conditional use permit process is conducted by our Pasco hearing examiner. Item, or excuse me, motion C uh, identifies retail cannabis as an outright permitted use in the I zone, so there's no conditional use permit involved. Motion D identifies the C2, C3, I1, I2, and I3 zones as opportunities for retail cannabis through the conditional use permit process. E identifies C2 and C3 zones as the locations for outright permitted retail cannabis sales. And then F identifies the C2 and C3 zoning districts uh, as appropriate for retail cannabis through the conditional use permit process. Um, I know those are kind of a bit confusing when you hear that. I'll narrate it to you, but i uh, be uh, more than happy to try to answer any questions. And Mr. Ferguson is available, of course, to weigh in with any council questions as well. Did I miss it? Did we go through G? Uh, well, I didn't. Uh, G is, uh, in the words of her city attorney, the choose your own adventure uh, option. <laughs> so Thank it you. doesn't list any specifics. Thank you for that. Um, any input, feedback, comments from council? Councilman Campos. I'll just highlight. Um, I think just uh, two comments that kind of stuck to me tonight is, you know, we got praised and applauded for a lot of the growth that we've seen in our downtown Pasco area. And I want people in the public to also understand that this is one of those items that we took very seriously and it's on the same line of thought as some of the things that we're doing in the downtown Pasco area. If it wasn't, I don't think that we would have spent the last year getting public comment and feedback and evaluating it and seeing, looking at it from a bunch of different perspectives. Um, and I hope people in the public recognize that it's, it's, not easy to follow along every single step that we take along the way, but I think that this, whether we move it or not, is something that we take very seriously and potentially could be something that um, could be beneficial to downtown area. Um, on that note, I don't think that, and I can't speak for the rest of the council, but from my perspective, this wasn't just a money grab. This is about, a uh, comment that we got tonight was about government's input in what a legal business can or can't do. We talked about uh, a vape shop, you know, what hazards they propose. You know, we have fast food, we've got breweries, we've got liquor stores, we've got places where people can go and have those vices that cause harm to your body, no different than this, right? Um, and I just don't think it's a money grab. We've looked at it from every different angle. We've listened to facts, we've listened to conjecture. There's there's a bunch of different things that we've evaluated. And uh, I'm glad that I, again, I've said this before, I'm glad to work with, you know, the rest of you up here. I think that you've all taken this very seriously and have looked at this through a lot of different lenses and whatever conclusion that you come up with is, uh, I, I can respect it even if I don't agree with it. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Any further questions, comments, suggestions? Councilman Serrano. Sure. Uh, while I remain opposed to any allowance here, um, just looking at the map, 
Uh, it's the last page of our packet. And it seems allowances within the industrial use covers the overwhelming core of what we're looking at without putting it terribly close to different parts of the cities where it's probably not going to be permitted. Some of those commercial uh, C3 zones are going to be buttressing schools as well as parks. Um, again, I'll state my opposition. Uh, it remains. But insofar as if this moves forward, it seems in the industrial zones, it's probably the most likely places where you're not forcing it way, way out of town, but you're also not necessarily putting it in the hearts uh, right next to certain prohibited areas. So um, again, I remain in opposition, but it seems like that's probably one of the best places to put it is, in my opinion, a conditional use is the best. Thank you. Councilman um, Brown first and then Councilman Mill. I'm just going to echo the last part of Pete's. I left my light on. I was going to turn it off, but um, you caught me. Um, I was reading. This is a lot to consume. Um, but again, I'm the last part of, of Pete's as far as the industrial area. I'm just perplexed in my own box of how the focus is that it's going to be placed downtown Pasco. That's my perplexity. I'm, I'm not sure where that came from because I'm not for that. Um, that wouldn't be my vote to put it downtown Pasco. That's just my box. Um, but on the, an industrial area or something like that, again, like what Pete was saying, that's, to me, conversation. Um, but I'm just perplexed at how the focus became that it's going to go downtown. And this is something that this council is proposing. That's my perplexity. Everybody has their own. I'm just perplexed about that focus. There's a focus on downtown Pasco, and I'm just perplexed about that. But we have a lot of com conversation. We have a long way to go in this. This is, for me, not a deciding factor tonight. This is just a decision on how to move forward, continue the conversation, and take a look at these zones for what they present. Am I correct, uh, Ms. Ferguson? That's correct, uh, okay. Mr. Brown. Uh, this is uh, truly just a resolution so that staff can direct uh, valuable resources in terms of time uh, drafting. As you can see from uh, the uh, the motions, there's going to be a lot of effect on a, a large area of, or, or many areas of our, our municipal code. So it's going to be uh, important that we uh, don't draft, especially uh, with a CUP process, a conditional use process would take us some time to draft as well. So we just want to make sure that we're focused on what council really needs because there's been a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, so really this is just an attempt to, to get some clear direction from council about what uh, needs to come back in the form of an ordinance. That At that time, uh, there's, that ordinance would be workshopped and uh, it certainly is in, uh, by no means uh, set in stone and is able to be amended in, uh, in all sorts of ways. But this is really just to, to try to make sure we get a clear direction from council about what um, ordinance you would like us to draft to come back with uh, but yeah this is this is not in any way uh, approving anything tonight perfect thank you for that clarification council member um, <clears throat> thank you mayor I've also uh, been against the marijuana all along um, but I would echo my other council members that if <clears throat> if we had to do it if it was the votes are there as our mayor has talked about in previous meetings that uh, if we had to do it, I'd be also for B, where we put it in the industrial zones. I know we've had discussions that maybe we'd put it in King City, that area, and then see how it went. Um, I'm not, a, yet definitely not for opening up this Pandora's box, but uh, I can't say if, if I had to choose, it would be option B. Um, I do have some good friends in the downtown part. I value their friendship, and so this makes it a lot more challenging. Because um, I know there's people that want it there, and again, I, I really respect some of these people, and I, I definitely don't want this to be where they don't want to speak to me. Um, but on the other hand, I, I just my conscience, what I feel my constituents want, and um, so that's that's my uh, my two cents on this. Mayor Patemaloni. Yes, thank you, Mayor Brahas. Um So for me. I'm, we're, we're, we're really wrapping, wrapping ourselves around the axle on this, um, and we continue to do so. Um, 
you know, what we've seen from other communities that are doing this, you know, for example, you know, again, I, I took the time, my, my personal time to drive up to Spokane, see how that, how that city was going, talk to um, city council members um, there in the city of Spokane. And the simple fact is um, it's just functioning as retail. Um, it's in strip malls, it's in downtowns, it's in wherever, and it's not seen as or communicated to, as a bunch of concerns from anyone in the community um, after the initial, you know, legalization of the state. Uh, we continue to talk about a lot of different um, kind of micromanaging sort of options, um, but I, I just really think that we're 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 you know getting in our own way of allowing the free market to do what the free market is going to do. Um, I, I think that if we continue, if we push forward with a uh, conditional use permit, we're going to see that the conversations about the health effects of uh, marijuana are going to be raised again to the hearing examiner. And of course, that's not something that the hearing examiner can make any determinations on. Um, nor is this an item that is or is not allowing marijuana to be consumed in the city of Pasco. As we've heard from law enforcement and advocates uh, both for and against, it's already here. Those health effects are already happening, and um, whether people are buying it legally or illegally um, is, is not really changing whether or not it's being consumed in our community. So I think we should stay focused on what are our core values. Um, my core value isn't isn't you know trying to raise tax revenue out of this. Um, that's that's not where I'm at at all. Um, it's allowing government to get out of the way when appropriate. So um, I would be some. I would I would support motion A um, if. Um, if council is in favor of a conditional use permit, I would begrudgingly uh, support option D um, or motion D. But I would; those are the two that I, I feel most clearly represent and match with the, what we need as a city. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for your comments. Uh, so, council, I, I hear your um, suggestions. I hear your voice. However, I did not hear your option. Council Member Campos. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. I think, and, and Mr. Ferguson can jump here if I'm wrong, but I think it's up to us to make a motion tonight and move forward on that particular motion. And if, if I could, could jump in here, I think Robert's rule allows any member of this here board to make a motion that they so choose. Um, the only caveat is that you as the chair have to recognize that, that individual. So um, I think if you guys are are ready to vote I, I would if I've got the floor I would like to move them on a motion are we ready to move forward hearing no comment you have the floor I move to approve resolution number 4303 directing the city staff to draft an ordinance to amend PMC 251020 and PMC 2590 PMC 25100, PMC 25115, PMC 25120, and PMC 25125 to allow the retail sale of cannabis in the C2, C3, I1, I2, and I3 zoning districts for motion A. There's a motion. Can I get a second? I will second. Motion is seconded by Councilwoman Roach. All those in favor say aye. 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 There's two ayes. Three. Three ayes. So that's a fourth lie for me. And uh, you, you see we, the Should eyes. we get a roll call vote? Uh, you can. Yep, that'd be great. Let's do a roll call vote. All right. Roach. Yes. Just, can just, I just ask? Just one clarification. The way this reads to me is C2, C3, and the eyes. And I'm not for anything but the eyes. That's so correct. if I'm saying yes to this, I'm agreeing to the C2 areas. That's correct. I'm not okay with that. Okay. So yeah. that would be an A. That is. But correct. I am okay with motion B. I just want to be clear. But motion B is where this guy's at. Okay. The only <laughs> one on the floor is A right so now. Right now okay. we're on an A. With the roll call. Okay, we're ready for the roll call. Councilmember Roach? Yes. Councilmember Serrano? No. 
Councilmember Campos? Yes. Councilmember Brown? No. Councilmember Milne? No. Councilmember Maloney? Yes. Mayor, Porten or Mayor Barajas? I'm actually going to change that to a no. So it did not pass. That was three to four. Um, and the reason why I said that is I, I would like for it to go on industrial and not downtown. Um, I agree. Um, I, I know there's a lot of changes that have been happening in our downtown area. We're working on improving. Um, and this is not because of the type of business. This is because I would like for... Um, we'd like to continue seeing the growth in downtown um, before we can move forward in allowing um, retail cannabis. Um, yeah, so I would just I, I support for industrial, um, for it to be in, in the industrial zoning. That's where I stand on that. Um, Councilman Campos. Madam Mayor, thank you. Uh, Given the floor, I will go ahead and try to entertain a separate motion. Okay. Uh, for motion B, I move to approve resolution number 4303, directing city staff to draft an ordinance to amend PMC 251020, PMC 25115, PMC 25120, PMC 25125 to allow the retail sale of cannabis by process of a conditional use permit in the I-1, I-2, and I-3 zoning districts. And we will get a roll call vote again. We got a second. Oh. There's a there's a motion. Can I get a, a second? Second motion. There's a second by Councilmember Brown. And now can I get a roll call vote? Yes. Uh, Councilmember Milne. No. Roach. No. Serrano. Yes. Campos. No. Brown. Yes. Milne. I mean, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Maloney. No. And Barajas. Yes. Can I actually change my vote? Surprisingly. <laughs> go ahead. Yes, so, you can. I mean, I know the mayor was well, going to go through, but I'd rather much have it industrial and downtown Pasco, so I will. So yes, surprisingly. All right, then uh, that's four to three. So the motion B passes. Okay. All right, so we have guidance. Right. All right. Okay, with that, we move on to our next item on the agenda. Uh, new business, none listed. Item 12, miscellaneous discussion. Uh, interim. City Manager Adam Lincoln. Just wanted to mention to Council, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, we started our, our celebration for Employees of the Year uh, this this past week. So we uh, we acknowledged four employees: our Firefighter of the Year, our Police Officer of the Year, uh, our IUOE Employee of the Year, and uh, our Administrative Professional Employee of the Year. And we will be uh, making sure to sort of rehand out those awards and acknowledge our, our team at the banquet this Friday at 6 p.m. at Red Lion. And we hope that you can all make it with your families. So thank you very much. Thank That's you. all I have. Um, anyone else have any miscellaneous discussion? Council Member Brown, your light is on. Do you have a? No. I'm caught up. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Bordemaloni, any uh, miscellaneous discussion? No. Okay, with that, we if go. Real quick. Just uh, shout out to our city staff. I'm going to be out of town this weekend, so I won't be able to make our annual banquet. So I want to express my appreciation for our staff. Congratulations to the employees of the year. You're doing a heck of a job. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just simply a thank you, and I apologize that I won't be there, but uh, I'll still try to be around when I get back. So if you're not there, who's calling out the names for the awards? That's that's your job. I wouldn't want to take that from you, Madam Mayor. You do a great job. 
Councilwoman Roach. I'm really looking forward to it and just want to say if there's any of those staff members watching or here today, congratulations and um, really looking forward to seeing this uh, event back in back in action. And I re repeat the sentiment from everyone already and I'll go back to Councilman Campos to add his comments. But really the city would not function without staff, without everyone behind uh, the executive leadership here. Um, so thank you everyone that works for the city of Pasco uh, in any shape. If you're a contractor, if you're a consultant, if you're hired staff, thank you for all the work and dedication that you put into running the city of Pasco. Councilman Campos. Yeah, just I'm, I'm looking forward to hanging out with Councilman Milne and his wife again. I got some great stories last year and I'm hoping to get a few more new ones this year. So uh, looking forward to it. All right. And with that... We're sharing the best news you guys have been uh, waiting for. We do have a need for executive session. Uh, consideration of site selection or acquisition of real estate purchase or lease, if likelihood that disclosure would increase price per RCW 42.30.1101B, uh, consideration of the minimum offering price for sale or lease of real estate, if there's a likelihood that disclosure would decrease the price per RCW 42.30.1101C, and um, uh, I am missing one more. Discussion uh, with legal counsel about current or potential litigation per RCW 42.30.1101I um, for, for 15 minutes. So it is 8.54. We will return, gosh, we'll return at 9.16. Fifteen minutes, correct? So fifteen minutes will take us to nine ten. Yeah, nine ten. I was giving you guys extra time because I know we're going. to...
right now? Okay. Oh, I'll wait. It is 9.08, and we do have a need to extend uh, executive session for 20 minutes to return at 9.28. Thank you.
It is 9.31 and we do have a need to extend our executive session for another 10 minutes to return at 9.41. Thank you.
Welcome back again. It's 945. We do have any need a need to extend for five more minutes uh, to return at 950. Thank you.
It is 9.52 and we are back from executive session and we are also adjourned. Thank you everyone that joined and stayed on this late. Have a great evening.